Good morning and welcome to Houston Baptist Church Online. We're going to show you a recording of last week's sermon and if you would like to join in with us in person you're very welcome to come along. We meet every Sunday at 10.30 and if you'd like to see some more details about that please check our Facebook page or get in contact um, using the details on the Facebook page and we'll give you all the directions you need to come along at 10.30 on a Sunday morning. But for now, I'm going to pray and then we're going to show you last week's service. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we are able to watch this at home this morning. Maybe we're not feeling great or maybe we can't get along to church for some reason. Uh, but for whatever reason that we're at home, we ask that although this is recorded, the things that are said would be helpful and encouraging and that you would speak to our hearts about you and what Jesus has done for us. Amen. So um, if you'd like to turn with me to Luke chapter 17 uh, and verse 11, we're going to start at and we're finishing at verse 19 and I'll pick up the rest of the chapter next week, which is a nice, long, difficult passage. So look forward to that. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 11, we're going to be starting at. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them and said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. One of them... When he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God? Except this foreigner, and he said to him, Rise and go your way, your faith has made you well. Shall we pray? Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, as we see what your word has to say to us today, would you give us a sense of knowing the truth that is revealed within these pages? Would you give me the words to say to open and expand your word, holding to the truths that it beholds before us? Lord, prepare our hearts to receive your word. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this great passage this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, I guess this morning we've actually got, for once in a blue moon... A passage that we can really relate to because of a massive situation that we have all come to understand over the last couple of years. We see ten men in quarantine here this morning, and I'm sure everyone here can remember something of what quarantine was like. If it was an individual quarantine where the government said ten days or fourteen days or seven, however many days it was, I'm sure there was a number of different ideas brought. Or whether it was just the communal quarantine that we all had to stay in our own houses and live amongst ourselves for year, six months, however it kind of worked out to be. This morning we come to a passage where we can kind of relate to the people in a very different way than we would have done a couple of years ago. We understand when people come to Jesus here, when these ten lepers come to Jesus and go, Lord, have mercy on us. Because I'm sure every one of us can think back to a time when we were all like these people, in quarantine, separated from our loved ones, separated from our, our friends and family, and had to live a life separate in this. And this morning we're going to see how these ten lepers, first of all, respond to Jesus, but also respond to the miracle that they see. And actually they experience more than what they see. These ten lepers have an experience with Jesus this morning, which is very, very, very individual for them. 
And so we're going to dig down, and I want us to remember the, the situations that we have been in because of COVID and the, the, the heartfelt pleas that these 10 lepers give this morning. So we see in verse 11 that we are on the way to Jerusalem now. Uh, this is the point where uh, Luke's gospel kind of changes and takes a turn and Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. This is the, the final uh, down to the climax of, um, of Calvary and of uh, his death and resurrection that we will cover in the uh, coming weeks. But we're on a journey now. And as Jesus is entering a village, we're not told what village, he is approached by 10 lepers. These 10 lepers approach at a distance. These are not people that are new to the quarantine rules that they are living under. They know how to go about their day. They are, they are told to separate from society. They aren't to come into contact with people. Because leprosy itself is a skin disease, it doesn't kill you very it doesn't it doesn't kill you in a in a very immediate way. It's a very long term disease that you learn to live with or they learn to live with. Today in our country it's almost eradicated well, I'm pretty sure it's eradicated in the UK. Worldwide there are still spots of it. But it's it's very, um, it's a very different world in which they lived in now to what we do today in terms of this disease. And these people know what they are supposed to do. If you look back in your Bibles, you'll see in Leviticus there is a set of rules set out for how lepers are to behave um, and how they are to uh, live. One major thing is they are to live outside the camp or outside the village. They are to be separated from the rest of society. Because contact with a leper means you catch it. It's very contagious. So much so that if you come into contact with a leper, you were told to live outside the camp for 10 days and come to a priest and check whether you still, that you have caught it or that you have um, not caught it. And this is what's going on here when Jesus says go to the priest. There is a protocol of procedures to go through uh, for them to be declared clean and to be um, declared um, recovered from this disease. But that doesn't generally happen in normal life. And this morning we see Jesus perform a miracle on these ten men. They first of all come to Jesus pleading for mercy, we see. Um, they, uh, in verse 13, they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They, saw, they came to Jesus, they stayed far off, they shouted to him, have mercy on us. They see that Jesus uh, is able to give them mercy. They come wanting to Jesus for mercy. They know that God is a merciful God. In um, Exodus chapter 3, we, uh, we meet um, God speaking through the burning bush. And we read in verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. These ten lepers come to Jesus because they see he is someone that can provide them mercy. Knowing that God is a merciful God from even before their time coming out of Egypt. But the whole Exodus story is God's mercy in, in the lives of his people. They come wanting to Jesus for mercy. And what a beautiful thing we can say, we can hold to the fact that God has always been a merciful God. But in Romans chapter 8 we read, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
We have a merciful God that throughout time has been merciful towards his people. But we can look towards when God will fully come to deal with the sufferings of this present age. With the sickness and the sadness and the crying and the problems that this world causes us because of the sin that has come about through us. We can one day hold to that we have a merciful God that has already accomplished all things, but we will one day see the new heavens and the new earth. Do you come wanting to Jesus this morning for mercy? Have you been in a situation this week? Are you, are you living through a life where you desire mercy from God? Like these ten lepers. Are you struggling with the ongoing life that you are living in this sinful world because of numerous number of issues? This morning I tell you that we can come to Jesus as these ten lepers and call out for mercy. Because God is a merciful God. <coughs> and whether the answer today like the ten lepers received from Jesus, go to the priest and they are cleansed. Your mercy that God gives you may not be for now, but we know for a guarantee because of Romans 8 that it will all be dealt with in the end. The Lord will have mercy in all situations. And if you read Exodus chapter 3, the Israelites have been going through their suffering for 400 years. And this morning I can guarantee that none of us will be waiting 400 years for that mercy to come. Because the Lord, we will meet him one day. Whether that's sooner rather than later for some of us, I may be waiting a little bit longer to see the Lord. But the mercy and the comfort that the Lord offers, we will all experience. We will one day have that restoration, that relief, that answer to our cries for mercy. But we've got to remember that no, we don't have to remember. We must remember that is what I meant to say. We must remember that God is a merciful God and that one day we will meet him and all all the cries of mercy that we have will be accomplished. If you want to ex understand and experience that more, we're actually going through a series on heaven at the moment, a Bible study, which was the one thing that we picked up a few weeks ago, was that our vision of heaven helps us deal with the situations that we are in today, because we have someone who has accomplished everything for us. And there will be no crying, and there will be no sickness, and there will be no sadness. And so in our story this morning, we meet these ten lepers who cry out for mercy because of the situation they're in. The quarantine situation that they're in. They are separated from their families and friends. Their hearts long to see them all. And so they come to Jesus. They travel to Jesus to catch him before he enters the village where they have no hope of meeting him. And they come to Jesus because they see in Jesus someone who... They can trust to provide them mercy. They believe that Jesus is capable of providing them mercy in some way or another. Jesus up to this point had, had done many miracles up to this point. And they travel to meet Jesus to catch him before he enters the village because their life depends on meeting him because he might provide them with mercy. They trusted that Jesus was capable of providing mercy to them. And this morning, I wonder how many of us actually truly believe sometimes in life that Jesus is the person that we can go to that will provide us with mercy and comfort and help. I'm not saying that we, are, we don't believe Jesus is God and he died for us and he rose again and that, we have, that he sits at the majesty on high. But in the everyday little things of life, how many of us really stand on the fact that if Jesus was coming over the hill that we would run to him for our problems in our everyday lives like the lepers here today do? 
Do we walk on in life trying to achieve things that we cannot do on our own because it's not really good enough or big enough for God to deal with? How often do we attempt to go about life and deal with the problems and anguish of everyday life that is stressful and challenging and do not go to Jesus first. The, the great hymn that we would have had if Sue was playing this morning would have been, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's a, a classic hymn. All, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs to bear. That's the line I'm looking for. Because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And I just, I stand here and think of time during COVID where the prayer meeting was full of people because the situation that we were in was, Lord, have mercy on us. And life hasn't got any easier from COVID, but yet we kind of drift away from the, the, the persistent need for prayer in our lives. How we can sometimes drift and go, well, it's not a really a big issue. I'm sure that I can deal with it for myself. And so we're not going to pray. Or we'll just, we'll just get on with life. Because getting on with life and just getting up and doing things is easier than going to the Lord in prayer. Which I am myself very easy to believe that. That it's easier for me just to get on with things than go to God first. We must be like the lepers who see Jesus to be the person who holds before them the truth and the ability to do all things. And secondly, this is a really ridiculous story we read here, the, 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 the miracle that goes on here. Because they call out for mercy, Jesus responds, go and see the priest without the healing taking place when they're with Jesus. But in the trust that they have for Jesus, they go. They go and head towards the priests. Without the cleansing happening there, they believe that Jesus has done, and whatever Jesus has told them to do is good enough to go. And on their way, of course, Jesus does the miracle. They are cleansed as they head towards the priests. In the stupidity of the situation, in the ridiculousness of, on the way to the priest, something was going to happen, they go. They don't consider that Jesus isn't capable of doing anything. They just trust him and go. And this morning I asked the question, how many of us, in the ridiculous situations that God speaks to us in, do we trust him enough just to get up and go and follow his voice no matter what, no matter what anybody else is thinking. So often in society we can be critical of what other people are doing because I've seen it better or I've done it better or I know what's best in this situation or so and so did it or so and so did it like that so you need to do it like that. We are so critical that for us to actually listen to God and just do what he says, even in the most ridiculous of situations, we can be put off because of what other people think or how it was done by so-and-so. But this morning we see ten people that no matter their situation, no matter what other people thought, the lepers got up and went because they believed that God was going to do something for them on the way to the priests. This morning, if you're thinking that God is speaking to you to do something, but it sounds absolutely ridiculous and it doesn't have any bearing on how we do church or how, the, how someone else has done that path, it doesn't matter because if God is truly speaking, God will make your paths straight. In Luke chapter 5, we read of another occasion where a leper is cleansed. We've already studied that some months back. And in that, Jesus touches the leper and he is cleansed. Here, Jesus doesn't need to touch the leper to cleanse them. He speaks and they go and they believe in what he is going to do and they are cleansed. God doesn't work the same way for the same people the same every single time. I can think of a number of occasions in church 
where people have do- looked like they're doing the same thing, and yet God has spoken and God has moved, that their stories are absolutely, totally different. I'm sure that you can all think of testimonies in this church or of Christian friends that you have, and they all arrive at the same thing believing that Christ died for their sins. But I can assure you that no one person's story is exactly the same. God speaks and works with different people at different times at different speeds. So if you are in a situation that you think is ridiculous and I'm not doing it the way that so and so did it or I'm not... If the Lord is speaking and the Lord is moving and the Lord is working, it does not matter Because it will come to pass that the Lord's work will be done. And finally this morning, we see the turnaround for the one leper. Now, ten people go out, ten people are sent to the priest. One person realises what's happened, he turns around and heads back to Jesus. He sees that this is not just an everyday activity... And in the joy of what's gone on, he doesn't go, I need to be inspected by a priest first to make sure I'm all right with society. Immediately he turns around and heads back towards Jesus. There is no point where he goes, oh, priest first, and then go and praise Jesus. No, I must catch him before he goes, because I might not see him again. This morning, how often do we go, well, I'll do that, 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 and then give praise to God first? Or how often do we stop and go, this is a great thing, Praise God first and then deal with the, the aftermath, the, the situations that we have to go with. The Lord deserves praise for what he does. Returning, he first of all, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. He focuses on God and what he has done for him and gone straight to worship. Because that is where we should be as believers. And Jesus notes that the one returns. Very, very distinctly notes, well, there was ten of you. Where are the other nine? Because this is a great thing that has just happened. Lepers don't just get cleansed. And he goes, well, the ten haven't arrived. Only one has. And in that... In that, Jesus says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. They trusted that, they all trusted that Jesus could do great miracles. But then, in Israel's history, lots of people do miracles. Moses does miracles. Elijah and Elisha do miracles. Right? There's a numerous number of people that do miracles in the Old Testament through God's power. And yet, this person, this one, turns around and goes, he's more than just a miracle worker. He's more than just someone that speaks for God. He's bigger than that. And he turns around and heads straight back. And actually, the passage here, um, when, uh, in verse 15 and verse 16, the wording here is like when the shepherds go to see Jesus and leave, having seen the baby born in a manger, and they go praising and worshipping God. The phrasing is so familiar there is, there is so many similarities in that. The joy that they saw set before them, they couldn't help but praise God. And here is the same. He goes to Jesus giving thanks for what had happened. We need to be like this leper, this one leper out of the ten. Consistently knowing that God has done great blessings and miracles in our lives. And if you can't think of any other blessing that we have received, the one that we can all hold on to that is a great blessing is the blessing that Jesus died and rose again for our sins. And that we are cleansed. And if that is not enough, I don't know what greater blessing you could be desiring after. Because that in itself is a big enough thing for every day to wake up. Lord, thank you for what you have done for me. And finally, this passage teaches us something about mission. You're thinking, what on earth does ten lepers talk about mission to us? But so often... 
On odd occasions, not on so often, on odd occasions I have heard Christians talk to me and say to me, well, if Jesus came back today and did the same miracles that he did then, the world would be saved and everyone would come and it would be great and the, the, if the Lord came back and just walked amongst us and just talked like he talks in the scriptures, everyone would just flock to him and be saved. Well, this morning, this passage tells us that that is a lie that we tell ourselves to make us think that we are not good enough for the work that God sets before us in mission. Because actually, the ten people meet Jesus, and Jesus does a great miracle, not just to someone, but to them. He doesn't just do it for someone for a show. He saves these ten people, and only one of them actually comes back And gives praise and glory to God and says, your faith has made you well. The other nine, having experienced everything, they don't return to Jesus. They don't see the great wonders that Jesus has done for them. And for us to think that if Jesus came uh, in 2022 to do what he did in in the year AD 30 or whenever it is, is a fallacy that we continue to tell ourselves because we think that God isn't able to use everyday people and that actually Jesus is the only one that can really perform um, uh, the great ambassadorship for, uh, for the faith that God wants from people. But actually, the thing is is Jesus does the miracles, and the miracles don't save him. And earlier on in Luke's Gospel, they talk about, well, if Jesus did more miracles, then more would believe. But even Jesus responds and says, well, that doesn't, that's not how it works. Miracles don't save people. The changing of the heart through the Holy Spirit is what saves people. The softening of the hardened heart. And whenever people say, well, if Jesus was here now, I would believe because I'd be able to see him do great miracles. Well, ten people saw great miracles happen and only one believed. So the chances of that happening, of course, if you saw Jesus do a miracle, wonderful, you might, it might drive you to see him for who he is. But miracles don't actually save people. It's having a faith and a belief in what Jesus has done for us at the cross. And by the Spirit, that is done through the softening of our hearts that we don't desire to be God, but desire that we have a God and he loves us. This morning, we must be like the one, not the ten. We must be like the one not those nine that turned around and went on their way. We need, to be a, we need to be people who see the great blessings that God has given us and turn them back and into praise for what he has done for us. We are to be people that long, that long for the restoration and the blessing and the need for crying out for mercy to be gone, to desire for heaven to be in the dwelling place of God. We need to be the people that see Jesus for who he is, not for what miracles he can do. We need to see him and we need to show him to those who love, to show for those who love themselves and not, and not God. We need to be people that show Christ Christ in our communities and not think that we need Jesus here for that to happen because we can hold on to the fact that Christ is in each and every one who believes and we just need to show his love that he has shown to us and pray that the spirit will work in the lives of those who do not know him. Well thank you for joining us this morning We hope that what you've seen and heard today is of some help to you. If you would like uh, some more help, you would like somebody to talk to or to pray with, you can get in contact with us. Please go to our Facebook page and you'll find all the details you need there to message us on Facebook or email or give us a ring. Uh, Please feel free to do that. And remember, you're always welcome to join with us on a Sunday morning in person as well. So we hope you're going to have a great week. I'm going to pray and then we're going to say goodbye. Thank you for the things that we've heard this morning. For everyone watching, 
And I pray that you would help them in whatever needs they may have right now. Please look after them as they step out into a new week and everything that they're going to have to do or all the expectations or concerns that they have. Please walk with them and guide them and be their wisdom and strength. We pray also that uh, for each one of us, we would know that there is an eternal hope, that because of what Jesus has done for us, that through faith in him, we can be justified by faith. We can be counted as righteous as him. We can be counted as if we had never done anything wrong and be in fellowship and friendship with you right now and forever. So please help us to take that hope to heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us. And we'll see you again next time.